The illustrious Jabba bids you welcome. <laughs> I'm going to regret this. I'm Pete Mitchell. He's Peyton Jones. And this is the Church Planner Podcast. Brought to you by Church Planner Magazine. Hey, Church Planner, this is Pete Mitchell. And it's Peyton Jones. We're back, baby. And you are listening to the Church Planner Podcast with Smack Talk by Pete and Peyton. <laughs> Brought to you by. Ooh, actually, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, our sponsor has been revived from the dead. <laughs> That's rad. We lied yes. to them and brought them back into the fold. No, I'm just kidding. We didn't lie to them. We didn't lie at all. No, but, but I suppose now is the time where we actually uh, actually read their commercial. I, you know, I'm going to read their commercial because they sent it to me. They said, "I have it." Oh, no, but you do it. Did I, they copy you, you so on good. it? Did they? If they copied you on it, you should do it. Okay, well, they did copy on it, but I think you should do it because I learned long ago from my brother who uh, he he had this thing he did with his wife where when he didn't want to do something, he really wanted her to do it. He'd tell her how good she was at it. So I'll never forget, I'm in his kitchen visiting he and his wife, and he's like, babe, you make the best tang. Remember tang, the drink? <laughs> he would take – my brother's a quirky guy. He's so funny. And uh, he, he would want her to make him a thermos of tang to go to work every day. He wasn't an astronaut. He was in the military, though. So he'd be like, babe, you make the best tang. No one, no one makes tang. And she's like, stop it, Trey. Stop it. And I'm like, what, what, Dude, I'm like, what am I tang. missing? Here? How hard is it to make tang? <laughs> like, that's not difficult. I know. So, so Pete, you, man, you read these commercials so good. Like, nobody reads these like you, man. I think you should read the advertisement just personally, just because you do so good. That's it, man. Game over, man. It's game over. <laughs> it's as easy as making tang. That's all I'm saying. You know, when I have a large project at home, sometimes it makes sense to do it myself. At other times, I actually save money in the long term hiring someone. And maybe more importantly, I'm able to focus on more of my personal mission and goals. Then I end up with much better solutions in all areas in the end. It's really not that different with church planning. Church planners who focus on building their core team, reaching their city, and partnering with portability experts like Portable Church Industries hit the ground running and thrive. Regardless of budget, Portable Church takes a holistic approach to stewardship, creating balanced solutions that value all of your church's resources. They help keep the big picture in mind when making short-term decisions and keep your team focused on more important parts of ministry. If you're thinking about launching in the next 6 to 36 months, we encourage you to check them out at portablechurch.com. That was amazing. Should I read the other one? I I think what you ought to do is I really hope you were like recording that video because I could just imagine how I looked (laughs) as I was reading that. You know that one picture you have? It goes, it used to go out on your marketing stuff. And I tell you, dude, you got such the shark smile right there. You had that. Look, look yeah. I remember there. you saying it had the shark smile, but I don't remember what the picture was. Yeah. It was just you grinning like the Cheshire cat, man, at the camera. I I'm think like, oh, the best, out. the best picture I have on my website is the one with me and Kathy Ireland. And right underneath the picture, it says, this is me with Kathy Ireland. She's not a client, but if you had a picture of you and Kathy Ireland, you'd have it on your website too. Exactly. I remember that. That was fantastic. (laughs) What's funny to me, man, I do whatever makes me laugh. I care not what the public thinks at large. Hey, so you know I have that thing. So I've just been on like a flying odyssey. I have flown and ridden on trains and buses. No joke, dude. It was planes, trains, automobiles. My good, good friend passed away, as I shared on the last podcast. I had to go from Los Angeles to London. Then after the funeral, 
I had to be in Atlanta for Sin Network champion training, which was just freaking awesome. But I had to take a plane from Cardiff, Wales to Amsterdam to Atlanta. Then a couple days later, hop back on the plane from Atlanta to Amsterdam back to Cardiff, Wales. And then, you know, never mind all the trains and buses I got to take in between all this stuff, right? Then I got to get on uh, back on a plane from London. So, you know, like normally I meet famous people when I fly, right? And, <laughs> and always. Yeah. If I actually talk to people, I might meet one or two as well, but I seek to not acknowledge people. I just always see him. I'm always like, hey, there's a famous dude, you know, always bump in. And especially like, LA to London. Hey, I was looking at uh, Kirk Overstreet's picture on, his, on Facebook. He went to Disneyland recently, and there's his uh, brother who is Badger in Breaking Bad. And all oh, I can yeah, think of yeah. is, there's Badger, man. There's Badger. <laughs> hey, that dude, that dude's mega talented. He did some stuff at Don Overstreet's funeral. Oh, did he? He sang on a ukulele, and man, was he talented. But here's, here's a funny thing. Is that um, I made uh, I made one of those embarrassing calls in life. You're like, there's a famous dude. I gotta say something. And it was this African American guy. He was on there, and I he walks down the aisle and he looks at me, and I do a hey, double take. Who's walking Remember, behind you, man? Who is that? That's that's Bo Moffitt. Oh, who just walked into my office. It's all right. You're on the <laughs> podcast. Welcome, up, oh, hey. welcome, Fred. Hey, welcome. welcome to the all magical right. world of podcasting. I want to be on it so bad. <laughs> When Pete dies, you can have his slot. <laughs> hey, and that could be at any moment, man. Any moment. Hey, hey, I'm. I, hey, don't joke about such things as death, my friend. But <laughs> I'm always packing, baby. I'm always packing. You never know when it's gonna hit. But I got to tell you the story, though. This guy. So I do that. He walks. <laughs> he walks down the aisle. And I look at him, you know, how like you just kind of glance up and he keeps walking past me. And all of a sudden it hits me. <gasps> That's the dude from Bubba Hotep. Remember the, the African-American guy in Bubba Hotep? I don't even you know what you're Bubba talking Hotep? about. Dude, Bubba Hotep? Never seen that? What? What is that? That's the movie about Elvis in the rest home. When the mummy from the Smithsonian Institute accidentally falls off the train into the stream bed floats down the stream right next to the Sunshine Home, where Elvis has secretly been hiding out. He's He's got a bad hip, and he's got to take his meds, but he's kind of half senile, but he's Elvis. And it's Bruce Campbell from The Evil Dead. Okay, so I know Bruce Campbell. Dead. Right. So so there's an African-American guy that is in the bed next to him, and they get to talking one day, and he says, well, I'm John F. Because he goes, I'm Elvis. And they always treat him like he's an Elvis impersonator. He's like, no, I'm really Elvis. You know, he starts finally telling people the truth. And uh, so the guy in the bed next to him, African-American guy, is JFK. And he said, you know, they had to put a bag of sand in my head. And he's like, but you're black. And he's like, well, I'm part of the witness protection program. They had to make it realistic. You know, everybody recognized me if I was walking around as JFK. So it's all about him and JFK, um, quote unquote. African American JFK and how they got to fight this mummy because the mummy's sucking all the life out of the old people. Yeah, you're wondering why I've never seen this movie. Oh, dude. The dude. more you describe it, the more I'm like, yeah. Oh no. oh, no. Oh, no. Like, Bubba Hotep is one of the best films ever made. It's right up there with Time Bandits. Don't mock me. And <laughs> it is in the same category. But it's freaking awesome. I'm not kidding you. I got a any, bad any feeling movie. about this. Hey, any movie that has as its premise an elderly Elvis and JFK fighting off mummies that are eating old people, well, sucking the life out of old people, you know, that's going to be a good film. Yeah. So did you go and approach him? I did. And what did you say? Hey, are you the dude from Bubba Hotep? What did he say? It wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> and and he had this full on African accent. He thought it was the best thing in the world. He's laughing, his wife's laughing, everybody's laughing at me. It was kind of embarrassing. And then uh when we're off of the plane, it didn't matter where I saw him. If I saw him near the Uber pickup line, if I saw him in baggage claim, he's like, Hi, hi, he's waving at me, and it just relived my shame and embarrassment. But that's the best story ever. You finally just missed. 
just missed. I did, but you know, I have a talent for finding famous people. You do, you do. You've got an amazing talent for that. I do. I, I just. What's funny I, you know, is like, when I see famous people, usually the first thought that goes through my head is, <laughs> "Yeah, I don't really care. You're not famous enough for me." <laughs> like, and I'm like, I whatever. Could be next to any man. Dude, man, I'm telling you, that was a that was a defining moment in my life. People who have who have not heard that episode of the podcast have no idea what you're talking about. But hey, that was a game changer. That story, I've shared that story so many times with people because <laughs> I, mean, really? I got nervous when Francis Chan came on the podcast. I wasn't I wasn't nervous with Philip Yancey. I mean, we made him mad, but uh. Francis Chan. You know, that was another story. I was really – because I respect him so much. I, I respect Philip Yancey, but I mean, <laughs> I don't know. It, I was in a mood. I don't know. But with Francis Chan, it was like I was nervous. And uh, and Pete told this story. Tell your story, man. You're like – you go, I'm not nervous with well, anyone, man. I could pee next to any man. Well, okay. So one of my jobs in a, in a former life is I, I, I worked as a benefits manager for a video game company. And uh, – this one day I was I was in the restroom standing at the urinal and in walks the brand new CFO. Now because I worked as the benefits manager, I saw all of his hiring paperwork, I saw how much money he made, I saw what the uh, bonus agreement was, what he was going to get for bonuses. It was a lot. And I mean I'm 20 probably 24 years old, 23 years old, something like that. And He's he's walks to the urinal right next to me, and I froze. I could not pee because I'm like I'm standing next to the CFO. I was like freaking out internally. So then you do the whole little fake hey hey, hey you know shake 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 zip <laughs> and wash the hands and leave because I was I was too nervous. And so is it like that scene on Along Came Polly when he's in the restroom and uh, one of the Baldwin brothers, Alec Baldwin's in there. No, I don't he's remember. Touching this. his earlobe, you remember that? No, what happens? Oh, dude, you have to see along came Polly. You want to talk about? Well, it's the been a while awkward, since I've seen it. I saw a long time bathroom ago. scene ever. He's standing at the urinal and he has OCD and he can't stand germs and touching people. And the CEO of the company is in there at the same time as him. And while he's talking to him, he's like saying, "You know, you're, I appreciate you." You know, and he he grabs his earlobe and starts doing this to his earlobe while he's at starts the urinal, rubbing his earlobe, starts rubbing his earlobe. <laughs> Between his thumb and working. Don't why no. That's like so many <laughs> levels of wrong. <laughs> it's a great scene, man. <laughs> See, that's where that's where you really don't want to do that next to someone like me who's armed. You Dude, you just I could I'm take that as assault. I take that as assault. Okay. I think I've mentioned this before. In the UK, you do not talk. Even to your best friend at the urinal. You go in there, you're quiet, dude. If you talk to somebody at the urinal, you will get hit. It's just, it's like spitting. Like, you know how Americans, we're good spitters, man. We love to spit. We were, we were going to a concert once, me and a buddy in Wales, and I kept spitting on the ground. On the, We were walking to the stadium. He kept going, dude, you can't do that. And I'm like, what, what do you mean? And he's like, no, you don't understand. Like, you're right now like the lowest form of life right now for doing that in Britain. Like that's just something we don't do here. Picking your nose. Hey, all I can say, all I can say to your friends in the UK, our our faithful listeners. <sighs> hey, we're back to back World War champs. That's all I'm gonna say. I'm just gonna leave it right there. <laughs> yeah, let me tell you what we're good at. Hey, there's two types of countries in the world today: those that are on the metric system and those that have been to the moon. I'm just leaving it there. <laughs> I'm just leaving it there, right there. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, you got a point there, but here, here's the point. It, it was so funny though because there there are certain things where I think there's a lot they're a lot rougher, tougher than us. Oh, dude, they and, fight way more than us. Oh, dude, we I'm just shoot you, but over there you got to fight. People don't know it is not like Downton Abbey. I keep trying to tell people it's not like that. It it, it can be a very dangerous. I do fight. not want to fight them. I will tell you that I do not want to fight someone in the UK. They got way more experience in the oh. old fisticuffs than me. Yeah, yeah. It, it's just like instant street ball. Just just take a take a kelp and put some beer down their throat and you know it's like three stooges, but. Anyways, what I was going to say is what's super funny is on on the other hand, they're also more polite. Like there's certain like codes of decency. So when you're on the sat nav there, 
um, that when the satellite sound, it doesn't, the American one goes, turn right, 100 yards, turn left. The one there goes, please make a left turn up ahead. Like it, it, it's all gentle and it's, it's super play. Thank you. It, it's the funniest thing because in Britain, there's kind of like this, you don't want to be pushy, you know? So there's this decorum that the sat nav has and Americans, we would just be like, dude, stop saying all, just tell me where to go. My, uh, my buddy and I, whenever we'd go out to, you know, to the have dinner together, go to the movies, whatever. And if we both walked into the bathroom and walked up to the urinal at the same time, he used to have like the best lines. So I would walk up there. And and I would try to like come up with something funny, right? And so I'd be like, "Boy, this water sure is cold." When I'm standing at the don't, urinal. don't go there. <laughs> well, don't go there. And this one time he goes and deep, <laughs> you know, like just <laughs> oh, we just lost all our people. No, no, it gets funnier. It gets funnier. And so we walked into uh, to a bathroom. This time I I don't know what we were at a ball game or something because it the bathroom was just. So many people. So I tried to do the same line, you know, like setting them up. So I go, boy, this water sure is cold, really loud. I mean, there's got to be 10, 15, you know, burly guys waiting in the bathroom. And he just looks at me and he goes, why are you talking to me? I don't even know you. (laughs) So my buddy told me a story the other day where a guy was in the stall. And he's like, (laughs) he's like, hey, what are you doing? And the guy's sitting there and he goes, uh, talking to you? What are you doing? And the guy's, the heaters, the guy go, oh, wait, hold on. Someone in the stall next to me thinks I'm talking to him. <laughs> He's on the phone. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, there's your bathroom humor. See, folks, this is what happens when Peyton goes away on vacation and, and takes a, a week off from the podcast. It's just, it's all downhill. The podcast goes south very quickly. We didn't even tell everybody what podcast. what kind of goodness they were going to get on this episode. What is today's topic? Today's topic, my good fellow, is about how you run effectively a small group discussion during your Sunday meeting. <laughs> Step one, by reaching the unreached. Well, Step two, laugh? talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's actually – actually, I talked about that in Church Zero. Cha-ching! Still got one in there. Uh, but uh, no, actually, um, I got an email from a guy who said, hey, man, do you know of any um, pastors who uh, do this or any church plants who do the, the whole discussion group thing? And um, I said, no, you know, I, I – I do, but most of them, you know, the, the thing with doing discussion groups in church is that it's often a um, trial and error deal. deal. So, like, I, I can't look back on all the years that I did. I mean, I did it a, a good many years. Um, right now, I'm in between church plants, but my next church plant will still involve that. I mean, that that is just something that I think is is crucial a to discipleship and B to evangelism and, and C to the spiritual development of the gifts, you know, people developing in their gifts in the midst of the one another's. Because to me, that's where the one another's really get practiced. So I can't conceive of going back into a model where I'm teaching people and they're just passively receiving what I'm dictating to them. So, but, but the problem is, is when people try to make this switch, often they get things wrong. And, and I'll be honest, I got things wrong a lot, but I was committed to it simply because I didn't start doing it in the church context. So I knew it was going to work. The problem was making it work in church. And because I had started a church in a Starbucks, um, and, and kind of morphed it into a church plan, all I did was copy the setup of Starbucks into the church. But when I watch people try to do it, they, they kind of get it wrong and it, it, it normally they quit it. So when he asked, do you know people? I was like, well, I could, I could check him at the, at the refuge guys. But even, even with refuge, like I've noticed that they, they're still kind of finding their way on it. What I'm really proud of them about is they didn't just go, Hey, here's the way that Pope Peyton set everything up. We're just going to keep it the same. I mean, they have changed a lot of things. In fact, their their current way of doing it is they trade off every week now. Um, they'll do 
one weakest testimony. And of course, it, it's a church that sees conversions. And so the, that's always very exciting. So they're like, look, we think testimonies are valid. Joshua's in church, uh, teaching. And, uh, and then they, they see discussion group. And so they're like, look, we want everybody eventually to cycle through and share their testimony. So we can get through 25 of those, roughly 26 of those a year. And, um, so, you know, it, it, it works, you know, but, uh, but I want to talk today about just pointers, tips, things that, that people may not realize, um, things that are robots, things that have been breakthroughs for us. And I'm going to try to do this heavily. Say that again. Ah, sorry. What, what was the first off? What was that? Great Scott. It's time for this week's topic. Let's get down to the nitty gritty. And so we shall. So here's the deal. Um, what, one of the things that's really interesting, I've been doing a lot of reading on John Wesley recently. Um, in fact, unfortunately, I inherited a bunch of killer cracking um, Methodist books from the 18 in the early 1900s. So um, sad, sad to say I got them from my friend. Uh, but, you know, they're amazing books. And um, a lot of them are out of print, and very rare. They were kind of like his prize books he never parted with. Almost all of his other books he got rid of. But what I'm learning about Wesley was that uh, he did some really cool things when he designed a church. For example, um, if he designed a church, he would often, I don't know if you've ever seen these before, but he had flip pews so that when you had a pew, picture a pew now in an L shape, that it would flip back so it could face the pew behind it. Have you ever heard of that before? I have not heard of it, and it sounds like a church that would make me very uncomfortable. Absolutely. But it's where the, the statement comes from, flipping pews. And as it says in parts of the Bible, and to this day, I've never, this is why it is said, flipping pews. I've never heard of the statement, flipping pews. Me neither. I totally made it up. But it was a <laughs> full segue into talking about the Bible. <laughs> So, you know, it, it's interesting because, you know, there are 23 one another's in the scripture. And I, I'll always kind of make the point that, hey, when do we have time for those to happen, right? We don't unless we make church interactive. The, the kind of the cool thing about refuge, why I think that they get away with um, not uh, having to do the groups every week is because they are so social because they start every service off by eating a meal together. And so they're in, they're sitting around tables. So the first thing that I would say, and by the way, this is for you, Jordan. You wrote me this, this week and asked to, to chat about this. So, um, this, I mean, sorry, Jared, um, this, this is actually what, you know, you've henceforth been, or before this, you've been called Jared. Men have called you Jared, but henceforth, I call you Jordan. So that's a Jesus move right there. But, uh, but, but basically the, the, the idea is that, um, you know, we don't really have a time to do that. I mean, we, we don't really pray together um, as a church. Maybe one guy prays and everyone else goes, yeah, yeah, amen, amen. And, and there's so many things because of the structure of our service, we never, ever get to practice so much of what was a part of the essential New Testament Christian way of life or, or, or Christian community together. So, you know, I'm always on that quest. You guys know, maybe a month, maybe six weeks ago, I did something on a, what would a, a liturgy be if we did, um, some kind of breaking up the, uh, the worship part. You know, we're, we're talking about the teaching part right now. But, um, but, but what does it mean? So, so Wesley had this idea that if you flip the pews back, then people could form small groups really easily in, in in their meetings. And I think that's super, super crucial. Now, if you have a church that starts off this way, so if you're church planning and you do this like early on, it's very easy and it sticks and people get it. It's small, it's intimate. But if you have a bigger church or an established church and you try to do this, people resist it. People will um, hang back. They, they, they won't want to be involved. Um, they'll say, oh, I don't like that. Right. Because like you like you pointed out, Pete, um, you know, here here we are. Um, you know, you're like, man, that would make me so uncomfortable. And yet you were in a church 
that had discussion groups. So first off, let me just kind of. You know, and I was very uncomfortable every single week because it's right. so not me. Right. Absolutely. So, you know, as you're doing that, tell me um, what is the uh, what, what were the things that you picked up from? it? I mean, what, what were the things, even though you were personally uncomfortable, what, what were your observations? What were some of your takeaways from it? I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't even know what to say. I, it, it's so not me. I'm such a, I don't know. Caesar Kalinowski and I were having this discussion. He was like, are you shy or are you actually an introvert? And I'm like, well, maybe I'm both. Cause, <laughs> cause huh. I just, I don't like people and I don't like meeting people or talking to them. <laughs> In fact, I was talking, I was talking to uh, Justin, the the pastor at my church, and uh, and he goes, "Oh, you remember so and so? I introduced him to you. He was the guy who said he works the soundboard so he doesn't have to meet people, and so I introduced the two of you to because I thought you you would be uh, you know good to to hang out together." And I was like, dude, I have already blocked that out of my mind. I don't even know who you're talking about. <laughs> like, like it is so against who I am as a person that um, for me, it was like one of those things that I just made the decision. I got to go through this because this is important to other people. Like it's, it's not, it's not for me, right? Like I think this is one of those things that everyone's got to get through their head. Church isn't about you, right? I mean, it's, it's not about you. And we go in there and we're like, well, I don't like this music or I don't like that pastor or I don't like this. And it's like, we're, we're trying well, to find this church needs air conditioning. Don't. Well, dude, let me tell you, that's just a basic human need in the world it today. Is. You know, and the irony is I totally agree with you, but I was the pastor, so I couldn't leave. <laughs> you already <I> left. <laughs> you left long before I left. That's always my backup. You you left. You you left. But um, so I mean, I already had the mindset that it's not about me. Like it's not about me. And I it, it's easy when you go to a church like Refuge Long Beach and you see who's showing up week after week. And these are not the white middle class people from Long Beach. It is the down and outers. It is the homeless. You know, when you're like plugging your nose, standing next to people, it's like, dude, that's who's coming to this church. So for me, it was really easy to have the mindset. It's not about me. And even though this makes me highly uncomfortable, like talking to people, I think you even like wanted me to lead one of the small groups. I was like, dude, I can't do it, man. It's just I don't feel like I got enough Bible knowledge or whatever. I just, I could at least go, look, I will be there. I will be in the small group. It's just, you know, it was, it was uncomfortable for me. I just, I'd made the decision. I'm going to do right. it no matter what. Right. And it, it doesn't matter that it's not my thing. It, it no. matters that it's other, it's for other people, not for me. I'm already saved. It's for the others who aren't saved. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's good, man. And, you know, it, you can see the benefits of it all around you too. Like, I think when you're an introvert, I think, I think you're right. It's kind of something that you did that kind of was making a sacrifice, a personal sacrifice for your own preferences. And I always think mission does that. I think that's what apostolic leaders are good at is kind of bringing different people with different preferences and beliefs together around the central core thrust of mission. And I think that that's something that you know, and, and you constantly give that vision. I mean, I constantly give that, hey, it's not for you. Exactly what you said. We're not planning this church for you. Understand that. You're here to reach them. And that's very apostolic. The shepherd come in and say, oh, no, no. You know, <laughs> the, the prophet would be like, no, no, we're here to hear from God. The teacher would be like, no, we're here to learn the word. You know, <laughs> the evangelist would be like, we're here to save them all. You know, everyone's got their, and, and the apostle, of course, is no, we're, I'm here to mobilize you to reach lost people. Mm -hmm. I want to awaken your gifts. And so each one of them has this very different thrust. It's funny. I was thinking about this. Um, this is actually going into my next book. Cha -ching. Um, but, you know, I, I was breaking down these five roles that really each one of them wants you to experience God, right? But the apostle wants you to experience God through mission. 
because I experience God on mission. If if I'm far away from God and I go on mission, boom, the Holy Spirit's just pouring out of me, right? Um, the prophet says, I want you to experience God through the supernatural. I want you to be a little uncomfortable and feel a little bit, maybe even tinged with fear because God's in the house. I want you to experience God in that way, spiritually, deeply spiritually, and sometimes even supernaturally. The evangelist wants you to experience God through the gospel, whether you're telling it or receiving it again. That's why when you're listening to the gospel preached, you just, you're happy as a Christian. Mm-hmm. Even though you've heard it a million times, you're experiencing God through the gospel. The shepherd wants you to experience God through other people. So through one another, through community. And of course, that's where Jesus promised. I'm, I'm there in your midst when two or three are gathered. And lastly, the teacher wants you to experience God through the word. And as you grow deeper and deeper in your understanding of the word, you grow deeper and deeper into your experience of God, at least the capacity to experience God. So uh, each one of these these roles, and this is a big tangent, forgive me, but this is just one of the things I'm geeking out on right now in writing. But um, you guys can have that as a, as a taster to the next book. Cha-ching! So, but, but here's the deal, you know, as, as you're looking at that, I do think that, that it's important for people to know that, look, we're, we're going on mission. And so you might be an introvert and this might be really uncomfortable. And I kind of liked, I remember you at one point, it was after we had met with, with Rick Warren, you had come to the point where you were like, you loved what he said about small groups where you were like, man, I don't got to lead one, but I could host one. You know, if you're an introvert, you could be like, I'll host it. I think introverts in those groups, because what we do is we have like a little coffee table. And so we went to Ikea and we bought little coffee tables. And uh, the little tables, they're rad. They're like 10 bucks. So we bought like, you know, eight of them. Like you want to change the life of your church? 10 to 12 people. That's good group dynamics sitting around a coffee table. Um, the little teeny, I think they're called LAC, L-A-C-K. And um, 10 bucks. And you just, you build them, take you like two hours to build all eight of them. And, um, you, you sit around those. And then we bought the trays that they sell at Ikea and we would just have like a plate, a paper plate or whatever with cool cakes and coffee and tea. And so when the last song of worship was played, if we did the discussion at the end, um, then we would bring out that tray. And, you know, if you were an introvert, I could see you going up and being the guy to go get that stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like, then you're, you're just kind of serving people. You don't have to say a bunch. You just serve. And if the Lord puts something on your heart, and I mean, I'm sure, Pete, you never just kept your mouth shut, you know, the, the, the entire, you know, few years that you were there. I'm sure there were times you felt kind of compelled to speak, right? And interact. I'm sure I did. I mean, it, I, it was, it was a weird thing for me. Like, <clears throat> one, I didn't, I, I didn't want to like, because I grew up in the church, grew up going uh, to Christian schools, dad was a pastor, you've got a lot of that that basic biblical knowledge that people in that environment don't have. So I was always, you know, aware of that and wanted to be careful that I wasn't like putting the God smack down on people, right? Where like the point of the discussion is just let people talk, right. let them share, you know? Yeah. What do they believe? And if you've got the crazies, then sometimes you got to like ring in the crazy, but let them talk. And that includes, you know, I don't know if I believe in God or I don't know if I believe that, you know, Jesus really came back from the dead, whatever, right? You got to let them talk. So I was aware that, you know, I have this knowledge that I got to be like, you know, careful of, of how I approach things and that I'm not just, uh, that I'm not busting a profit move, right? Where the profit's right. going to be like, let me put the God smack down. You know, I have to take on the thing that I don't have, which is the shepherd. Right? <laughs> no one's ever going to accuse Pete of being a shepherd. That's so faux bad. show, you know, because that that's the environment of that. And I think for me too, it was like part of the reason why I was uncomfortable leading it one, because I'm not good at meeting people. Like, it's just right. not my thing in a group environment. Like, I can go up and meet individuals one-on-one. It's not a big deal. But in a group environment, I'm the wallflower, right? I go to the party. I'm the guy sitting at the wall going, okay, can I leave now? Have I have I done my duty here? Can I, like, you know, take off, whatever? So I think that was, like, 
the bigger hurdle for me and why I couldn't lead a group. It's like, I'm not good at like meeting people and being like, Hey dude, uh, Hey, homeless man. Number one, you know, what are your thoughts? Like, I just, it, it was so not me. Yeah. Yeah, no. And you know, as, as, as you do this, I, I think you bring up a really good point. Um, it's really important to train people. So I'm going to head into that in just a second, train people how to run these and how to do them. <laughs> like you said, you rein in the crazy. Um, there is a really good way, but, but also too, like for an introvert, like I would tell our people like, Hey, if you don't, no one has to participate. Like well, you're never going to pressure somebody to be, you know, to participate. Um, the group leader can carry it by asking stimulating questions. And I'll get into that with the training, but the reality is people should feel the right to just sit there. There's nothing wrong with that. And if the same person just sits there, I, I don't, because like you can tell when it's just somebody who's just an introvert and shy versus someone who's ticked off, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and angry like that's, that's a group killer right there, you know, but you're not going to have that with someone who's just an introvert. So that's okay. You know, um, also too, um, I would tell them, this is what I was going to say. I would, I would tell them just pray. If you can just sit there and not open your mouth, but if you'd be praying for this group right now and be doing some spiritual warfare and spiritual battle, um, I'm one of those guys. It's just kind of charismatic enough to be a little crazy to think that maybe God's real. And like when we pray, it actually matters and maybe stuff happens. So I tell our people, Hey, you know, pray. If you're there praying, that's fantastic. Never, never forget a story that's in Spurgeon's, uh, one of Spurgeon's biographies that somebody asked him, he was turning them around the church and, uh, on a Sunday morning, guest speaker. And the guy was amazed. He's like, how do you cram so many people in here? Like literally there's standing room only. There wasn't standing room. People were in the aisles. They had to literally ask people not to come one Sunday a month. Because there's just too many people. They couldn't all fit in. So he would say, would you sacrifice one Sunday a month and not come so others who normally can't get in come in? And so there would be like a crowd pressing against the building. This guy said, I, I just don't get it. You see so many converts and, you know, these are hard to reach people. And Spurgeon said, well, let me let me show you one last thing. He took him down to the basement where there were 200 people praying. Mm. And he said, that's the secret. That's the engine room of everything you see here. That's what's running this thing. And, um, he also had people train that when, uh, people that were Christians were there, were seeing people being affected by God and by the gospel, he would call them his bird dogs. Um, Spurgeon didn't do altar calls, but if someone was there breaking down and crying or visibly affected or kind of staggering out of their pew, like, you know, like, oh my gosh, what just happened? Spurgeon would call, he said, I have my bird dogs here. And he says the gospel wounds them and sends them, you know, flying to the ground, but bummer dogs go and get them. And so even there, that, those were like his evangelists and his, his apostolics. There, there were people that just had that gift and they would just bring them to Christ. You know, they would finish the gospel work. And so I think that, that small groups, it, it gives that opportunity for the average believer who to be on mission really. And that's what excites me apostolically is that I'm seeing people who literally are able to be on mission on a Sunday service, because quite frankly, I just don't think it works if you're trying to be on mission some other time. But what you do when you're together doesn't have mission hardwired into it. I think that every time we meet, we need to have something of the apostolic, the prophetic, the evangelist the shepherd and the teacher are hardwired into it because that's who Jesus, that's what the ministry of Jesus actually looks like. So why would I just have the teacher every time I come together? And then who knows where the worship thing fits in? I guess some people could say the prophet, but if it's just singing, maybe not, you know, um, I don't know. I, I don't equate singing to God as, as the prophet. I kind of see more like the use of the gifts, which happens by the way, in these small groups as well is someone might say, hey, can I pray for you and lay hands on them? Healing can be done in small groups. Prophetic words can be given in small groups. Um, you know, you can give, you can exercise. If you go to Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, 
and look at the gift of giving. Someone could be going through a hard time. I can't tell you how many times in a small group somebody shared something and somebody reaches in their pocket and hands them a hundred bucks afterwards privately. Um, you know, th- these are just. Well, why didn't I, you ever tell me about those small groups? I was going through it back then. <laughs> I kept hoping and holding out. I heard you say that one, but it never happened. It's because you didn't have enough faith, Pete. (laughs) (laughs) By the way, by the way, if you're new to the podcast, we do not believe in faith teaching. That is literally just a bad joke, like all of our other jokes. So here's the deal, though. Um, When it comes to training... Wait, 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 wait. Could you, like, shut up and give us the money? (laughs) (laughs) So, So when it comes to training... Um, that's the core. I mean, that is really the key, I think, because when you're, when you're dealing with small groups, it's, it's hinged on the leader. So again, you need one leader. The leader needs to be very skilled in asking, searching questions. Um, what we call follow up questions, something I learned from Mac Lake, um, which is kind of, here's the deal. Like you can, um, you can be in a, in a small group and Mac Lake just brought this up. I was with him last week and guys have, just stinking genius when it comes to to asking questions. Um, in fact, he pretty much spent a whole day teaching us how to do that. And one of the things that Mac brought up is he said, "Look, you know, we." Uh, he goes, "You've been in discussion groups, home home Bible studies, where someone asks a question. It's right out of the Bible study. You know, it's in the it's in the curriculum, and he lets everybody answer. And then he goes." Cool. And then he just moves right on and asks the next question. And what, what Mac has kind of trained church planning trainers to do anyways is to ask follow up questions. Like, like let's say, um, you say something like, Oh, you know, um, I'm not very good at that. Then you could ask a follow up question. And this is a lot deeper. I mean, I, I would love to do a podcast on asking good follow up questions. Um, you know, just from what Mac Lake taught, taught me. But the reality is, is that you can ask questions like, well, you know, why do you think, or, or, you know, uh, think of a time you can ask them for a story. There's a bunch of different things you could say, well, what would you need to do to, to, to get, if you, if you, you know, where would you say you're at on a, on a scale one to five? And then they think about it and they go four. Well, why would you say that? And so there's a lot of cool ways you can go, but I think we need to train our people to, to ask good questions. I think we need to train them for proper group etiquette and not just so that they know as group leaders, But I think they need to know um, how to teach others proper group etiquette. So if you have somebody who is a blabbermouth the whole time, um, I'll mention names like Peyton Jones or anything. um, You have to be able to take that person aside and say, um, hey, brother, look, uh, you know, just even in the group, say, hey, hey, Um, you don't have to confront people. You just say, hey, you know what? Um, I appreciate you wanting to to participate. Let's give someone else a chance to answer. I, I want to hear from some of you guys that have been a little more quiet, like Pete. No, I'm teasing, but but you just you know there's a way to gently do that. You got to kind of um, train people, and then if if they don't get it, um, then you have to take them aside, you know, one on one and very gently because you don't want to tamp anyone's zeal down. You want to you want to say, hey, I'm so blessed you're in this group and you love this. And you just don't do it heavily. You just say, Hey, look, uh, I want to, you could even tell those people, Hey, I would love to, to, to teach you to do what I do for, for leading a small group. Let me, let me share with you some things that make this good. And I can see you're really uh, geared up. Maybe one day you'd be a small group leader on this, but let me kind of teach you what, what, what we do and why we do it. And that's a very disarming way to, um, to help kind of correct somebody and bring them onto your team. It's very diplomatic. You don't have to, hey, you talk too much and I need to tell you off for that. No, that brother means well. You know, he's excited. You know, you don't want to tamp people down in their excitement. So, um, you know, a lot of training goes into it. Um, the thing where, like you said, what about when somebody says, I believe Jesus was a space alien. and We all need to meet him out in the desert and play harmonicas and bring him back down to earth. Well, you know, or, or if you got the guy who believes in the flat earth in your group. And he, he just hey, wants to hey, talk hey, about hey, flat hey, earth. Hey, all the time. hey, 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 hey. It is flat. <laughs> you are falling right into the stereotype, my friend. And the moon is hollow. It's a space station. It is. It totally is. <laughs> Occupied entirely by reptilians. That's their secret headquarters. I'm just saying. Uh, hey, hey, what? we don't want to say it. 
they are part of the Illuminati. Okay, so go on. You get the okay. flat earthers that want to take up the whole time right. talking Don't about flat earth. Don't take it serious. Don't take it serious at all, except for Smack Talk. Take that very seriously. So here's the deal is that, you know, you, you have to be able to deal with that. So, like, for example, I, I have wacky people every once in a while. They, they turn up and they mean well and they, they say wacky things. And I just get them back on the topic. Hey, um, that's cool. Look, and I'll just say it like as if, you know, like I would deal with it the same way I deal with a non believer. I'd say, hey, look, guys, we're all entitled. Obviously, there's going to be a tons of different opinions here in this group. And uh, our rule, our number one rule is we respect every opinion here because they're opinions. And if you find the person goes, no, it's the truth of the word of God, they got to go. You know, I mean, it, eventually they're going to probably, unless they can be talked to, those people always wreck it. Because <laughs> here's the deal. Like when when I train missionaries, I always tell them, look, you have to wade through, whenever you're talking to non-believers, you have to wade through tons of wrong things before you get to the gospel. And Jesus is a master of this. So, for example, people always tried to throw Jesus off. And he would come right back to it, like the woman at the well. Well, you Jews say the place we ought to worship is on the mountain in Jerusalem, but we Samaritans worship. And Jesus just, he just keeps cutting back. He will not get sidetracked on that stuff. She kept bringing up, and it's kind of a defense mechanism. Sometimes you're going to get a little bit too close for home for people. Um, they'll throw up smoke screens. Well, what about aliens? What about evolution? Um, it, you know, and, and I would just say in those situations, hey, look, uh, you know, look, it doesn't matter if you believe it. It doesn't matter that. What we're talking about today is this. And we just want to stick to this topic. Um, boom, boom, boom. And so, I just kind of redirect people. And if it's a wacky view that I'm worried that somebody's going to equate all Christians believe this, like all Christians vote for Trump, all Christians believe the earth is flat, all Christians, you know, and it's something where like, I just know this is going to be a a, a stumbling block for the gospel. I talked to my neighbor today and uh, my daughter was dressing as Michelle Obama because she wanted to pick someone from history. She, she had to, she had this thing called Wax Museum, and she had to um, dress as a woman from uh, American history, and she wanted to be Michelle Obama. Now, if you know my daughter, I think it's because she wanted to wear a fancy outfit. She didn't want, like, a Quaker outfit. She wanted, like, a nice, really cool thing from, like, whatever shop my wife shops at. So she got that, right? But she got to be Michelle Obama. And the funny thing is my daughter's African-American. And, uh, you know, all I can, all I can picture, I was telling my neighbor, she said, will they be pictures on Facebook? And I said, yes, there will. And all I could think of is the, the comments that will, oh, Michelle Obama from Christian people. Mm. And which is crazy because in the African American circles, they would be like, no, she could totally be a Christian. You know what I'm saying? Whereas in the white circles, it's no, it must be Donald Trump as a Christian. I'm not saying all white people. I don't want to label that you and i don't think that um bodas right here sitting next to me but um <laughs> i'm just teasing but the the reality is i i just made the point of i said hey my uh i said yeah i just gotta like kind of get you know any i'm just waiting for the comments on facebook and you know like hey you know shut up you know when when they give my daughter a hard time and she goes yeah she goes i don't understand how anyone who believes in god would think Trump is a Christian. And, and, and so it was really kind of a, a great segue into a, a, a deeper gospel conversation. And so my point is, is that even that kind of stuff, like imagine if that had come up in a small group, that would have been a wonderful topic. But of course, it's fraught with landmines. So you just got to kind of know your group because you might have someone there who's like, Trump is the best. And then you might have someone in there who's like, dude, I'm so embarrassed to even be associated, you know? And so you're going to have on these different topics, you're going to have sometimes people are like the drunk uncle at the party and you're like, oh, it's embarrassing. You know, you're like, you're part of my family, but you're kind of embarrassing me right now. And so at the end of the day, it's just, it's training and you have to take your people away. You have to train them. You have to say, look, guys, we're not going to get bogged down on that. We're not going to you know, we're not going to get all mad about the stuff that everybody's mad about. We're going to keep on the gospel. 
my favorite expression, like Fat Albert on an ice cream truck. You know, we are not going to move off the gospel. You just study Jesus at the well with the woman, the Samaritan woman, for just an amazing lesson in how to just dodge all the peripherals and just keep on this central issue. Where are you at with God? And you don't have to like directly do that with people. I, I would say this as well. Um, your questions need to be pre-written that I would usually say only have two, maximum three. Having too few will make for a very short group that's kind of boring. Having them, um, you know, uh, too many, you'll never get anywhere. And your question, you should tell your leaders up front, these are the two questions. This is where I'm going. This is what the message is about. This is where I want you to end up. And you'll get there in a different way because different groups are different. Different people are going to take it different directions. But this is where I want you to end, right? This is how the questions were strategically crafted. So you need to learn how to make a good question. And one of the one of the ways to make a good question, I just learned this from um, Mac, was, I mean, I just do it intuitively, you know, but Mac had a cool little formula. Um, where he said, you know, what are the, what are the mistakes that people make? You know, what are the assumptions that people make? What are the opinions of people? What are the, what are the lies people believe? You know, you could, you could draw your, your questions from all that. And in a well-crafted question, for me, might sound something like, um, let's say I were, uh, uh, preaching to unbelievers and I want to get to the heart of God's love for them. I would ask them a very searching question such as, if God could say one thing to you today, let's say maybe I start off by saying, if God were real, what do you think he would think of you? You know, I might ask, um, you know, if, if you, if God could say one thing to you, or if you could say one thing to God, what would it be? You know, if you could ask one thing, like, I mean, they're just, there's so many cool questions that you could ask. I and mean, I'm just pulling these out of, this, these aren't based on a message. It's just, these are the kinds of questions that get to the well, heart. You know, that's actually an interesting thing that you brought up because you and I discussed this before. <clears throat> but when you were leading that in church, and this is something that I think the leaders need to be careful of. You had really bad questions. Because the questions, and I remember us talking about it. You're like, you're right. You know, I need someone else yeah. to come up with the questions. Yeah. Because you were so into your sermon, you had these yep. questions that I'm sitting there going, dude, I got a background in Bible. And <laughs> I don't even know what the question means, let yeah. alone how do I come up with an answer and, and facilitate a discussion. And yeah. then we had guys like, uh, you know, Chris later on and, and, and stuff where their questions weren't nearly as difficult to understand and to communicate. So it's just one of those things that you do as a, as a leader, you've got to be wary yeah. of that. You have to think about it. It's, go, okay. It's there's... something that I have grown in for sure. And I think nowadays, you know, I, w I would ask differently, but I remember at one point literally saying because of exactly what you said, um, I'm too, too up close to it. Right. Yeah. And I can't, and what I, I remember at one point, I can't remember what church, whether this was in Europe or here, but I appointed someone to write the questions as I was preaching. Yeah. And it, it, it might've been, I don't think I gave that to Kirkhoff. I don't think that would have, but they, they had to go give it to the overhead guy. And if, if you can, you know, cause what the mistake I would make is I'll write my sermon and I would, re I always revise it. It doesn't matter if you give me two months to prep mm. a sermon, always the morning of, I'm going to turn up and probably rip it up right. and rewrite it. Right. That's just, it's just who I am. And, and part of it is there's a prophetic kind of, um, a prophetic kind of unction that I, I feel when I'm getting ready to preach. And so, um, th that's a big deal to me. And so, uh, but if you can write them beforehand, you know, someone just told me about a feature in Logos that what Logos, uh, Bible software does is it now has a direct feature where you can drop, um, questions into the slide. So you can build the slide presentation as you're, Interesting. yeah, as you're preaching. So if you felt like, Hey, I'm better at this than Peyton was, um, then you can do that. You know, you can actually come up with them. And I think if I didn't wait 
till the last minute because normally I do it Sunday before I grab everything and head out the door. And you just gotta think. You gotta you gotta spend time with questions like that. You could even almost um, reverse engineer it and ask your questions first. Read the passage and ask some questions before you prep your sermon, and then maybe tinker with them and play with them later. But um, but yeah, that was something that I remember the freedom I felt when I was like, okay, maybe I don't. And that you bring up a really good point. Maybe you don't got to be the guy writing the questions, you know? Because right. I I found that was easier if I wasn't. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So gosh, I I forget this stuff, Pete. So it's so funny, man. Because uh, we're we're getting ready to. Um, it's funny. I was chatting with Andrew this morning, and and she was saying, "Man, I'm really starting to get excited about church planning again." And after all the crap in the last couple of years, um, where you know, I mean, I'm always ready. But there's been times um, in the last two years in particular, I'd say, where the wind got knocked out of my sails enough where I haven't felt that same zeal personally. In fact, if anything, a little bit of the fear has come back to plant, whereas uh, it's been a very good thing to start feeling some of that zeal. And we can feel it, man. We can feel that stirring. We can feel God kind of um, really giving us that that adventurous spirit again, that um, you know, cause right now, to be honest, the last couple of years, we've just been licking our wounds from deaths and illnesses and surgeries and cancer and house flood. And I mean, it all just kind of snowballed in the last couple of years. So it's been, it's been an interesting time, but, um, God is good, you know? So we're, we're starting to, to kind of ramp up to that. And then the, the last thing I would say is, um, you know, again, it, it, it goes down to training, as I mentioned. Um, so first off, structuring your church. Make sure people are sitting in small groups. I told you half circles, Ikea furniture, tables. Make sure they have tea, coffee. That's very welcoming. Welcoming. We've talked about questions, talked about training. Um, you will find sometimes leaders uh, who say, I don't like this, and they won't participate. Uh, let me just kind of mention that we, we had a situation um, once upon a time where, um, one of my leaders, uh, wives wouldn't participate. And I, because she was a leader, um, I was like, Hey, you know, and, and, and could you, and it, it kind of became a thing where, you know, I had to kind of take her aside and say, uh, you know, uh, you know, we're, we're going to have to talk about this. And, um, so we did, and I just explained that, look, some people, like Pete, don't like this kind of stuff. And um, anyways, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're able to, to, to work through it and get there in the end. So it was fine. But anyways, hey, hey, I don't want to take up um, too much time, but I do just want to say one of the things you'll have to constantly do is when you're going to do this, if you're going to make it work, you have to say constantly from the front why you do it. It's anything you do. Picture the person who's brand new in your church the first Sunday, and they don't know what hit them, right? They walk in, and they're like, man, what is it? Like, why are we sitting in rows? This is weird. You have to constantly communicate what you're doing and why you're doing it. So, for example, I would say something like, um, hey, guys, now is a chance where three – this is where the three things um, came from, my, one of my mantras, which was there are only three things need to happen. doesn't matter how we get there, but three things need to happen this morning. Number one, we need to hear from God. Number two, God needs to hear from us. And number three, we need to hear from one another. And I might throw out, if I were the guy doing it, I'd say, hey, you know, there's uh, 23 one another's in the scripture, and uh, we we take this seriously. And so what we're going to do is yada, yada, yada. And, um, and, and so just over-communicate what you're doing and why you're doing it. And uh, so, guys, that is it. I'm going to wrap up there because I could talk about this all day. But again, Jared, that was for you. And um, guys, just want to say thanks for joining us today. Before we go, let me tell you about SimplifiedChurch.com. SimplifiedChurch.com is an online service that you can use for bookkeeping, IRS compliance, any kind of admin stuff that you don't want to do, even personal assistance. You can get in touch with SimplifiedChurch.com. And they will help you with that. Just tell them Peyton and Pete sent you. Guys, this has been Peyton Jones and Pete Mitchell on the Church Planner Podcast. Reminding you, if you want to reach the ones nobody's reaching, you need to go where nobody's going and do what nobody's doing.
Thanks for joining us for another weekly episode of the Church Planner Podcast with Pete Mitchell and Peyton Jones. We'd love to hear your comments on this episode of the Church Planner Podcast. Visit us online and let us know what you thought at churchplannerpodcast.com. If you subscribe to us via iTunes and have enjoyed the podcast, leave us a positive review. The more positive reviews we receive in iTunes, the more iTunes will promote us to other church planners who would benefit from this show. This podcast is brought to you by the Church Planner Magazine, which is available in the iTunes newsstand or online via churchplannermagazine.com. Thank you.